Good afternoon, this is Schweitzer, and this is a video that we are looking to describe a little bit about um, what makes a solid a solid. You'll see here a list of our um, standards. So take a look. Um, so what makes a solid a solid? Turns out that not everything is a solid at all conditions. So there are some things that we can control about a solid, and there's some things that we can't control about a solid. So a, we call I some is called external factors. These are things that we can kind of control, and there are things that we call internal factors, like what inherently causes one thing to sort of stick to another thing or bond to another thing. Um, this is really along the lines of either bonding. Um, or intermolecular forces, things of this nature. This is in a chapter of uh, states of matter, and we've already covered a lot of this material. But we'll be, this material will get shoved right into uh, the forefront. So we'll be reviewing that again here shortly. But external factors uh, are going to be temperature, thing we can control, temperature. We can control, or, yeah, sometimes pressure. Um, typically the volume might be something we can control, but for solids, volume is not a huge determining factor, but when you get to gases, it is. This particular presentation is going to be really highlighting the idea of temperature um, as an external factor. So, all right, so we have a balloon here, and let's compare and contrast these two balloons. Notice that the balloons are the same size. So the size is the same. Um, they contain the same one, two, three, four, five particles. One, two, three, four, five particles. Uh, okay, same number of particles. Um, what's different about these things? Well, it would appear that, well, one is the, the substance is different. Um, and also, you might notice that um, the length of the lines are a little bit shorter in this guy. So the length of the lines is a little bit shorter. I also would note that what is um, the same about these is both balloons have both uh, short and relatively long lines. So not all of them are the same length. They got a short one here and a real long one here. So just like here, we got a short one and a relatively long one. So, all right, so those are some things we're going to kind of try and explain here uh, in a moment. But, okay, so notes on temperature. What is what is average kinetic energy? Well, average kinetic energy, first of all, energy is energy. So it's the, it's the average moving movement, Um, moving energy. So it could be of a gas particle, it could be of a tank. So this is kinetic energy equals one half the mass of the particle or the thing times its velocity squared. So this is the mass of the velocity, mass of the particle, and this is the actual velocity. And because not all the particles are traveling the same exact speed, the length of these arrows represents the, is a vector representing the speed, we use an average because not every particle is traveling the same speed. So you'd never want to draw a particle, um, a, a, a model like this, where all of them have the same speed, the same length. Never works that way. Some are going fast, some are going slow. So not every particle has the same temperature, you might say. Some are hotter, some are colder. One particle might just be sitting still completely. Inherently, there would likely be at least one particle just sitting still. So we use an average, which means the average length of the arrows. On average, these, le these lengths of these arrows are shorter than these ones are, longer. So this length actually represent velocity, just the velocity, not the temperature, velocity. So this guy, the lengths, are actually describing that guy. The actual velocity of the particles. Now, with that being said, no, these are both the same temperature. 
So how can these guys be longer, or these guys be shorter, or having to be the same temperature? That's because of the mass. Okay. So a fast-moving, heavy particle like this guy, and a fast-moving, light particle, this guy has to have higher energy. So um, equal energies, a heavier particle is just moving slower. So we have a, a lower mass, higher velocity for given temperature. So there's a key point there. This is the temperature, and that's what we want to know. Um, why are we averaging them? Because there are some are slow and some are fast. Um, molecular velocity is the actual speed, actual velocity, and really important that the kinet average kinetic energy, that line means average, is the temperature. So although the temperature course temperature corresponds to velocity, like faster moving particles for a given sample, of the faster it goes, the warmer it is. But it also includes the mass of the particles, the total energy of the particles. This is temperature. Average kinetic energy is another way of saying temperature. And that's really, really important because we use that a lot, okay? What's another way of saying temperature? Average kinetic energy, okay? All right, so another way that we might use to describe this balloon would be what's called the Maxwell's distribution. What are some key things that you'd want to note about these? One, the line always starts at the origin, because we always have at least one particle that's just like sitting still. And then it goes into a bell curve because we have lots of, it's like an average, you know, the we have lots of particles that are traveling the middle of the road speed, like your average. This would be your average, average velocity. Um, we have some particles that are traveling super fast, but not very many of them. And we have some particles that are literally just sitting still, but not that many. Most particles are traveling. This, this should be a little smoother here. Sorry. Um, there you go. So, and then I think you might want to remember is that the area under the curve represents the total number of particles. So the, the number of particles traveling very fast would be like this area here. Same as the particles traveling slow. But these particles right here are traveling the fastest. What might, what might a particle diagram look like if we raise the temperature? So for a given balloon, same number of particles, we would just want the particles to travel faster. So on average, we'd have one, two, three, four, five. Still have one that's like sitting still. But then on average, the particles, the lines would just get longer. Still have a short one or two, but some longer ones. So what would this guy look like? Well, keep in mind, if this is our original line, all right, let's start that over. All right, so if we want to make this thing like this, that's our first line. What would it look like if we warmed it up? Okay. Well, first of all, remember we got to start here and the air in the curve has to get, has to be maintained because it's the same number of particles. So on this guy, what you do is you would have to stretch it out a little bit. And it looks something like maybe like this. Okay. Now you'll note that we don't we may not have as high a peak here. This is my average right here. All right, this is the low temperature, low temp, and this is my high temp. On average, more particles have higher temperatures than do low temperatures. I couldn't go, if I, went as, if I start here and I go as high as I go here, then I'm gonna, I have to get more, more air into the curve, I can't have that, so. Either way, this is kind of the we would look at here. 
what could the Maxwell curve look like for the two different samples? So they're both at, let's say, 25 degrees. So they both have the same temperature. Um, but what does it look like for the speeds? Keep in mind that kinetic energy equals one half mass velocity squared. This guy's got a molar mass of 32. This guy's got a molar mass of 4. So the increased mass means that we have to have a decreased velocity. So in this case, uh, and the area of the curve would represent the same. So once again, let's just say that this is the O2 balloon. Okay. Okay. So you can do a better job than I can here on this drawing pen. So this would be the O2. So again, on the situation where we're drawing these things out, you have to start here. And it's going to look very similar to warming it. This would be the helium. On average, faster moving particles must start at zero, same area under the curve approximately. Because it didn't go as high, I had to stretch it out a little bit far like that. And that's the curve. Faster moving particles, slower moving particles, same temperature. All right, so our units of temperature. All right, so a couple things here. We've got several units. The main ones here are Celsius, Kelvin, and Fahrenheit. Okay, so what's an absolute scale? It's a, any scale for not just temperature, any scale that's based off zero. So, meaning that zero actually means zero. If you have zero mass, like your weight's zero, then you have zero mass. Almost all our scales are absolute. We tend to use a relative scale when it's hard to measure. Um, some things aren't as easy to measure as other things. So, in this case, we might use a something, some, some relative point. Could be historical. Um, it, it it just depends. It's using some arbitrary relative point to measure off of. Um, you could a good example. This is golf. So golf uses two ways to measure: total number of hits, okay, and then the um, what's called par, which is sort of a general baseline as far as what we think would be a good number of hits on that particular course. The number of hits isn't always good because, well, um, some golf courses are harder than others. So a particular hole gets a par, and that number of holes is rel so how many hit relative to that value? You could hit a zero on a zero, par, you know, you're at par. If you're at par, you basically are at zero. You're, if you hit uh, less than par, you're negative one. If you over par, you're positive one. Does that mean that you, if you're negative one, that you somehow lost a hit? No. You're negative one relative to this value. On an absolute scale, you just would not have a negative value. You just can't go below zero. So you'll notice that both Celsius and Kelvin are, Celsius and Fahrenheit are both relative scales. People didn't really realize what temperature was for a very long time. So zero um, on the Celsius scale isn't actually zero. It's the freezing point of water, as you'll notice right here. And the boiling point of 100 is the boiling point of water. Now, if you look at Fahrenheit scale, it's kind of unique here that the Fahrenheit scale at, is boiling at 212. So there is 112 units of difference here. 32 for this guy here, there is only 32 units difference here. So they're getting closer. And both of them are what we call linear relationships. And you should realize that at this point, that a de one degree Celsius does not equal one degree Fahrenheit. Okay, if that makes sense. If I raise a room 25 degrees Celsius, that wouldn't be the same as raising the room 25 degrees Fahrenheit. Look at the steepness of this thing. A Celsius gives you more change. And then you'll notice at some point right here, right there, they actually cross, or they're the same. That's at, at um, 
negative 41 degrees Celsius. So that would be like an excellent <laughs> Jeopardy question, right? Um, but either way, and eventually this thing, they cross over. So one more thing you might want to notice here about this is that the difference in temperature between Celsius and Kelvin are identical. All right, they're always 273 units difference. When we created the Kelvin scale, we just simply adapted the Celsius scale to Kelvin and just basically slid it over to where we thought the zero point should be. So, all right, so here are a couple things here. Three rooms are raised 20 degrees, 25 degrees, but room A is raised 20 degrees Fahrenheit. B is raised 20 degrees Celsius, and C is raised 20 degrees Kelvin. If they all start at the same temperature, we rank the rooms from highest to lowest temperature. To highest to coldest. So highest, um, in this case, uh, well, the Celsius and the Kelvin will be the same. And in this situation, it looks to me like um, a, a degree, like we change a degree of Fahrenheit isn't going to be nearly as much as a Celsius. The steepness here okay, is causing it to become a greater slope. So I'm going to say that these two will be uh, bigger than the Fahrenheit one will. That's not really a big deal to know who, which one's bigger. Okay. Um, what you gotta realize is they're not the same. Okay, that's the main thing. Derive a formula converting Celsius to Kelvin. Okay, so Celsius going to Kelvin. There's 273 degrees difference between these two. I always forget this, so I kind of have to figure it out on my own. So I know that zero degrees Celsius equals 273. I know that negative 273 equals zero. We call this absolute zero. Okay, so that means that this is the Celsius. So Celsius plus 273 equals Kelvin. If I put the zero in here, zero plus 273 equals 273, or put, put a negative 273 equals zero, which is that guy, this is my formula. Okay, that's one you're going to want. Uh, so a heating curve. So heating curves are are great for warming things up here uh, as far as temperature is concerned. So we're basically using the heating curve to kind of talk about temperature a little bit. And what happens when you warm things up? We should understand that if I warm things up temperature, so temperature and heat or adding heat or energy are two different things. They're not really the same thing. So heat causes is one form of energy that can cause temperature to increase, but it's not the only thing. Again, remember, can you heat something without warming it up? So let's talk about this here. Uh, ice is warm from zero to 50. Sketch a, a heating curve, okay? So we've already seen these earlier in the year. Looks like this. And, okay, I, this is not a to, to, to scale one. In fact, I'm gonna redraw this little one a little bit here. There we go. So we have solid, we have liquid, and we have gas. A couple of things I'd point out about this that are really important. Here we have temperature on this side, but we have energy added on this side. Energy added. So a few major, major things here. One, that this is the temperature here, which is the difference from going solid to liquid over to this way. This is the melting point, this temperature here. This temperature right here is the boiling point. We call any energy added, you'll note that this temperature here for water is zero degrees Celsius. This temperature here for a liquid, you know, this is ice, that's liquid water, is zero degrees Celsius. So we added a bunch of energy but we didn't raise the temperature. Changing phase does not change temperature. All the energy is going 
towards breaking bonds. Breaking or depending on where you're going, forming bonds. Okay, same thing here. And you're going toward breaking, severing intermolecular forces and bond, intermolecular bonds. And that way as well. So we call this your delta H of vaporization. This one's called delta H of fusion. Again, main things. This is the temperature melting point, boiling point. Same temperatures on both sides. That's super important. Okay. Sample of ice is warm from 10, negative, negative, negative 10 to 50. So it's like right there. Draw a sketch in, on the graph, indicate the heating curve. I think we've got, we got that. All right. Can a liquid and can a liquid and a solid at the same temperature? The answer is yes. At the phase change. What is heat fusion? Label the layer F. I did that. I did that. It's the energy needed to convert a solid to a liquid. And of course, this is done by breaking bonds. Um, okay, so you're adding energy to break bonds. Same thing here. Okay, energy that is going to use. If we're going from a solid to a liquid, then we're breaking bonds. We're going liquid back to a solid. We're forming bonds. Same energy. But we're going from now from a liquid to a gas, either going that way or going back. Same amount of energy. And I labeled both of those on the graph. All right, so again, this is just a reminder here, what we have here. And if we have delta H of fusion, we're going from a solid to a liquid, we're adding energy. We we'll call this endothermic, by the way. Endothermic. This one's endothermic as well, but now it's vaporization. Go back the other way, we go from a walk from, let's do it this way, uh, H2O gas going back to H2O liquid, okay? So we're going that way, and you'd have to have the energy on this side here, okay? Or going this way, the energy would be right here. All right. Um, provide here the heating curve for Ethanol, which the following is true, it takes the same amount of energy to melt one gram of ethanol and one gram of, of uh, well, it says ethanol for both, so I'm going to change that. Uh, one gram of ethanol to one gram of water. Okay, this is for water, this is for ethanol. And for that, we'd note the long line here for water. And therefore, we're going to say no. Longer line means more energy added per amount. At 150, ethanol will be a solid. Okay. And this is a solid, this is a liquid, this is a gas, and definitely not. It's way up here. Just continue going. Both? No. So neither of these guys. All right. And we'll stop our video there. Thank you very much.